reading the most sublime hysteric by Slavoj Zizek, notes on chapter 5. Now you may recall the logic of exception presented in the earlier video which seeks to situate the relation between the ensemble and the elements at the level of the elements themselves is one which can be potentially adopted by any signifier. Perhaps a utopian vision would be that each take turns to play the role of the exception that holds the whole together. I think it is important that we notice that we still do insist on signifiers as names, words, etc. to function as the exception. For the whole referred to by each signifier functions constitutively by this same logic. That is to say, differentially, defining itself in terms of what it is not, i.e. there is always something that must be excluded for the thing to be what it is. Without a constitutive exception, a thing would have no exterior, nothing that holds itself together against, and hence would be pastut or possibly incomplete. A possible example of this exceptionality would be symptoms, traumatisms, and blanks, as Zizek terms them, empty, non-historicized spaces in the subject's symbolic universe. These would be domains upon who signification is conferred retroactively. Given the bodily nature of the experience we are referring to, this is a conception of language that is phenomenological, and Merleau-Ponty is cited as a reference. I recall a video which I saw on YouTube, an extract from The Pervert's Guide to Cinema, in all likelihood where Zizek talks about the choice presented to Neo, then Mr. Anderson, played by Keanu Reeves, about whether he should take the blue pill and remain inside the system of the Matrix or whether he should take the red pill and see the world beyond it, i.e. the Matrix is a simulacra that uses humans as biological batteries to fuel its illusion and of that other worlds gathered in cities underground who choose to resist it. He, Zizek, explains that the choice is never really about remaining in the system or choosing the outside. Bear in mind that Zizek himself lived through the disintegration of Yugoslavia and took part in the first free elections in 1990. The point that should be observed here is that it is precisely alternatives presented in these terms which should be resisted, i.e. you are either inside or outside the system, you are either for or against us. His demand for a third pill from Morpheus is in principle not unlike that of the character of Cypher, who makes a deal with Agent Smith which allows him to stay in the Matrix in a new life with more comforts, etc., at the price of betraying the crew of the Nebuchadnezzar, Morpheus's ship. The demand for the third pill is one which like Cypher's choice, is as someone who is already outside the system, but wants back in, realizes as it were that the choice, that the first choice itself was a false one, i.e. we outside the system find life unbearable and dream of a prelapsarian time. The point indeed is a more psychoanalytical one, for it directly concerns how we perceive our own position with respect to the symbolic order. To better explain the predicament, an example from his later book, Less Than Nothing Serves Well. The Lacanian IQ test is basically a barometer to test the subject's attitude to the prevailing authority. An idiot is simply outside the system. Let us call him an orthodox red pill user. A moron is one who is inside the system, believing in orders stupidly. An imbecile is simply between the two. The trick is... How can the trick is how we can leave the system without sacrificing our dreams, remembering that our life in the system may be a manufactured product of ideology. When Zizek says, for example, that the goal of analysis is to produce the recognition of desire in full speech, that is to integrate it into the universe of signification, we need to properly comprehend that the symbolic is the medium of any possible mediation between the universe of signification and our imaginary. Regarding the subject proper who is included or rather realizes himself totally in the other, who as it were comprehends or rather realizes 
his symbolic realization, is read to be one who functions as a corresponding cognate of the symbolic machine, i.e. of the structure without a subject, which to me at least sounds like the matrix. A subject as such is conceived as having a sense of independent consciousness when it can hence be real when it can hence be realized that they are capable of demonstrating the possibility of mediating their relation to the symbolic order that is of understanding appreciating criticizing i.e. reasoning without which they would be reduced to an instrument in its functioning yet we are provided a formalization of this process of mediation if i may call it that it posits a bad non achieved past tooth or not all other tellingly one which has a non symbolizable extimate kernel at its core i.e. a subject capable of having alienations of their own it is only from the bad other a that we can grasp the subject bad s a subject without such a constituting exception without a whole as zizek puts it is a complete series whose only possible relation to the structure is total alienation which paradoxically to me at least is likened to all encompassing subjectivity the fact that the other is lacking is read in the proof of the sub of the object a which may perhaps appear in the form of a symbolic demand total alienation is avoided by positing himself as correlative to this demand or better yet the structure of this remainder inscribed as bad s corresponds to a read as the bad subject is a correlative or perhaps corresponds to the object cause of desire the barring of the other as presented in the inscription represents to us that the other is not a mere anonymous machine but another who lacks the object cause of desire another who wants something from the subject to place a preliminary observation about such a formulation we must ask would not a bad subject acting as a correlate to the object cause of desire substantialize the subject as it were perhaps revealing that what is actually bad in this lacanian formulation is any true idealism another aspect which zizek presses is to place before us the existentiality of the subject of the signifier that exists to the extent that the other is capable of demanding something of the subject my former question is met within the text as zizek acknowledges that any reference to a bad other would seem to relegate hegel at least to the background in the depiction of the lacanian stages of symbolization would entail an other hold by the obstacle of a real impossible kernel which or whose inertia blocks dialecticization an obstacle that sublates it in and through the symbol in short the quintessential anti hegelian other the undoing of a thing or what is termed das ungeschehen machen is in some ways a chronicling of the end of the analytical process presented in this text where three stages or passes in the symbolic may be represented one symbolic realization which may be read as an accomplished historicization of symptoms two the experience of symbolic castration or symbolic destitution presenting a correlate to the original repression and opening the way to the desires of the subject to the level of the other Three, traversal of the fantasy that corresponds to a fall in the object that plugs a hole in the other. It is interesting to note that Lacan seems to explicitly state what is to be his take on the concept, that unique and exceedingly simple thing that the talking cure and philosophy seemingly share, which is here presented as the time of the thing. it is not the same as the thing because it is always where the thing isn't or attributing this to hegel a concept is what makes the thing be there while all the while it isn't this is what is referred to as an identity indifference 
characterizing, as it were, the relation of a concept to a thing. Perhaps not the greatest account of Lacan in his account of concept production, and by the same token, making the Delusian project of a transcendental empiricism and the many variations it may have inspired from Nick Land to Nathan Brown, and his differential ontology all the more interesting. Though I believe in such a representation, what makes the depiction appear weak is the absence of negation, whose very noticing forms such a key feature in the enunciation and traversal of the path of truth in Hegel. Also, I think there is a rather hasty superposition of negation with the death instinct to present the first evident example from Hegel's phenomenology itself. It may be night and you may choose to write this down on a piece of paper. Nothing changes in a truth when you write it down. Tomorrow it is morning, but the paper remains the same, but perhaps prompts the past tense with regard to the sentence. Zizek, however, puts this as an annihilation of the thing, the moment it is symbolized, but also the unity of the thing is decentered in relation to the reality of the thing. And this, I believe, is hasty indeed. For any given determination of a thing, the calling to name of any of its traits, characteristics, semblance, shapes, etc., necessarily abstracts from the thing. And this, I believe, is important in his own work. We then see what is presented ambiguously in another superpositioning of the death instinct with the symbolic order itself. Yet we have provided a rationale for this insofar as it follows laws beyond the subject's imaginary lived experiences. The density of this conjuncture cannot be overemphasized as it marks chiefly to my mind at least the split or schism between leading post-structuralist proponents, namely Foucault and Derrida regarding the use of ecriture and how we might envision the autonomy of a text, though this might have to sacrifice the initial structurality of the insight. Yet it is precisely the possibility of this autonomy of the symbolic order, and indeed its possible narrativization, if you will, such as in the case of jurisprudence, which allows for its central scope to exceed that of the imaginary homeostasis of the pleasure principle. It is for this reason that Lacan says that the symbolic order is rejected by the libidinal order, which includes the whole of the domain of the imaginary, including the structure of the ego. And the death instinct is only the mask of the symbolic order, a curious turn of phrase towards the end. It is also possible only at the symbolic level, of course, that any possibility of undoing the past rests. The word for it in German is ungeschehenmachen, which may properly be translated into an undoing, and, or rather an unmaking, and Zizek notices that the same term was used by Freud as well as Hegel. What is actually posited here, in a way that does appear to resonate with the term, is the likening of it to the negation of the negation. Here, the syllogistic mechanism in play is not exactly the reconciliation between the synthesis and the antithesis for it does not read these two as antithetical propositions in the first place. What Zizek seems to be doing here is negating the negation, as it were, by positing that it never produced the schism in the first place. This, of course, being a gesture that may be posited only retroactively. I would advise you to read this section. We are also quickly reminded from a quote from Hegel's Encyclopedia that sublation consists in positing that the illusion has not yet been accomplished. This dimension of futurity is vital and I believe it is instructive to identify the role negation has in this. As Zizek presents elsewhere, when a bar or obstacle to an, ob to an object of desire is removed, we do not get the pure experience, so to speak we realize that it is precisely the inhibitions which created that facet as an object of desire in the first place. To present the predicament, Zizek has this to say, as we advance, we never seem to reach our destination until all of a sudden we, are already, we have already been there the whole time. 
too early suddenly turns into too late without allowing us to determine the moment in which this passage occurred. I think it is crucial that we intervene here and clarify a few basic objections. One, if the right moment, as it were, is marked by the object R, would it be reductionist of me to suppose that object R could be a commodity? Or would such a naturalization substantialize what is in effect a necessary symbolic or algebraic entity? Two, consider for a moment that object R were a commodity, or perhaps even a historical article such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Then could it not, could, could not its process of production, the, the political forces of the period, and of course its composition, not yield what may well amount to a moment if that is not an inadequate phrase for such a temporality, where our encounter may yet take place? Indeed, without being too mysterious about this, I would say such a gesture of ideology critique characterizes much of Zizek's own work. An example, if it may be called one, even as it may be paltry to the spirit, is the way Hegel would come to view crime and punishment. During his earlier years in Frankfurt, we witnessed the mechanism of judicial legal punishment. He witnessed the mechanism of judicial legal punishment to be an external mechanical coercion. This, as it were, would foreclose any reconciliation between the criminal and the community he may have violated with his actions. We find his position change, as it were, in his mature period. From his philosophy of right, the judicial punishment already accomplishes true reconciliation and the retroactive suppression of the crime. A crucial difference is marked also in how the action of a criminal is interpreted in the mature period. And I hope you see how this ties in with the last video. The criminal act is not a particular act. It is by necessity contains the moment of its universality, inasmuch as it is the action of a rational and responsible being. The universality of an act arises from the recognition of its principle and the presumption of its alleged normative universality. Another way of putting it would be to say that it that in emphasizing only the mere particularity of the content of his actions, he in no way presents his act as a norm, which is universalizable. In other words, the criminal is recognized as being rational through the means of punishment. When thinking about how Zizek's philosophy in terms of how it is oriented, we would notice broadly that it is a subject-oriented philosophy, and we would be well guided as we are in this work to recall the Kantian distinction between phenomena and nomena can indeed coincide in a subject. In a quote, man is on the one hand a phenomenal being caught in the chain of natural causation and on the other a nominal being capable of self-determination and free action. A construction which seemingly prefigures the perhaps more properly medieval question of free will and determinism. And yet, almost on the heels of this, we find that the conviction behind an act is insufficient for its effectivity, which can only come from the recognition of others. This, indeed, is a structural problem, and one which the beautiful soul understands too well. And despite the truth that the subjective position may articulate, its complicity and self-blindness in the role it plays in an apparently tragic scenario belies that of an exploited victim, a seat that it occupies perhaps too comfortably for some. Perhaps exemplary of this position is the role played by the suffering mother. Quote, the flow of her complaints is nothing more than the inverted form of a demand addressed to her family to accept her sacrifice. What is necessary for the beautiful soul here is to renounce the subjective economy that leads to this narcissistic jouissance of sacrifice. Yet, in another mode, though perhaps not in an altogether different register, the disappointment of the beautiful soul resides in the particularity of the injustice it identifies. A literary example is cited. 
Henry James's The Turn of the Screw, where a governess who sees evil spirits everywhere is presented as the true evil. Perhaps this is how the true source of evil is not the sacrificed contents themselves, but their very form, perhaps exemplifying in turn what Hegel may refer to as ungeschehen machen, or undoing. Now, like the last chapter, this too deals with certain concepts and certain arguments which have been made that are per perhaps best graspable when this section were to be read, and that is something that I would encourage you to do. And yet I believe it's important that I was able to read this out in a manner that is deliverable, that allows you to see how it, at least I as a reader am following the logic of the sentences, because what was emphasized, if you recall, even in chapter four, is that we are dealing explicitly with the logic of the signifier and the conjunction of this logic with the terrain of how the psychoanalytic experience thinks about a subject's engagement to language, about how the signifier mediates our relations with any objectal reality, functions via this logic of when the lalang is, or rather our subjective being in language, punctuates or cuts through a certain signifying chain to in some ways not necessarily grasp, but at least find a determination in the referent when we, for instance, refer or talk about something or perhaps select something and so on and so forth. Or perhaps, you know, use an object to make another object and things of that nature. But I'm not looking to try and find materialized examples of this because I believe that there are terrains and there is a logic produced in this chapter which is entirely imminent to Zizek's own work, but it has living, breathing embodiments among in fields, particularly in linguistics for sure, but particularly those who are not satisfied by the linguistic account of our, of our engagement with language and reality. And this is basically the uh, mesh or the schism which is repeatedly brought up here. And how we understand this interface is, I think, going to be key in even the later chapters in this book. Now, having said that, I will, of course, leave the text itself in the link in the description box. And as always, I do thank you for your time and wish you a good evening. Bye-bye.